Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, and this is Dadvice TV Live! It is 6 p.m. Eastern Time on a Tuesday, the 25th. So if you're watching at that time, it is live on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitch. And you can say hello like Lester here and ask questions. Now, today we're going to be talking about low-protein diets which is something we get, uh, or we hear a lot about, and there's a lot of controversy about um, online. A lot of people misunderstand how to do a low protein diet and why you would do, or who would do a low protein diet. Now, for those of you that are new, let me do a really quick introduction about myself. My name is James, I am not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian. I am a kidney patient. I was just a regular guy going about my life, eating away, loving buffets. All of a sudden, I'm in the hospital in the ICU for a week with kidney failure. Doctors told me, you need dialysis and a transplant or you're not going to make it. Well, I never went on dialysis. Instead, I worked with my doctors. I changed my diet. I changed my lifestyle. I worked with the best person you can work with when you have kidney problems, that's a renal dietitian, and I kicked kidney disease to the curb. I went from kidney failure, stage five, to stage four. Now, stage four isn't that great, but I kept fighting. I kept making changes, eating right, eating healthy, making good choices, and all of a sudden, boom, stage three and not one single symptom. I have tons of energy. I am no longer knocking at death's door. I'm out there living life and loving life. Now with me today, it's Tuesday. You know who we have with us. We have a real genuine renal dietitian, Jen Hernandez. Hey Jen, say hello. Hey James, hey everybody. I am so happy to be here as always. Super, super nerding out, excited about our conversation that we're going to have today. You guys don't even know. I already <laughs> I already have new parts of this conversation that I already need to update. So it is just such a fascinating area when it comes to kidney nutrition. And I am so excited to be sharing it all with you guys. All righty. We got lots of people saying hello. And I actually want to do a special shout out right here at the very beginning to some friends of mine who have a YouTube channel called Pasta Grammar. Ava and her husband, Harper, I love their channel. You guys should check it out. It is absolutely hilarious. Now, the thing I like best about it is first of all, she's from Italy. Her husband's American. She came over here, she's trying American food and oh, she's not liking it very much. So she's showing him how to make real food. And the way she makes it is really healthy and awesome. As a matter of fact, her cooking inspired me to let go of my, my go-to meal, stir fry. You guys know that's the only thing I could cook was stir fry. And now I've started making a lot of Italian style food that is kidney friendly. And we'll be talking about that soon in a show. So I wanted to say hello to Pasta Grammar. Glad you guys are here. And everyone else, check out their channel. It's hilarious. <laughs> Now, this we're, we are going to probably use up every single second of today's conversation, or of today's time, talking about low protein diets and kidney disease. So let's get right into it. If you have a question related to low protein diets and kidney disease, put a big old Q parentheses or colon right before your question. That way it'll help stand out on my screen and I'll try to work all the questions in during our time here. But I can tell you, Jen and I were talking earlier, boy, we got a lot of great stuff to go over. So let's dive right on it. So first of all, Jen, what is a low protein diet? 
So a low protein diet is really the the time when someone would want to restrict or cut down on their protein. There's three macronutrients, there's carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So a low protein diet focuses on cutting down on that percent of your calories that you get from protein, one of the three macronutrients. So the general recommendation for protein intake is 0.8 grams per kilogram of your body weight. That is the general guideline. A low protein diet drops down to around uh, 0.6 to very underneath the 0.8 range. So it's cutting down, it's restricting below what the general guidelines are. And this is something that we need to think about with rebalancing the diet, rebalancing. If we're gonna cut down on one of the macronutrients, we're going to have to change the other two. So fats and carbohydrates will become adjusted when we do focus on this low protein diet. And honestly, the biggest challenge I would say, and even just kind of starting off with the low protein diet, isn't even dropping down to a lower protein intake. It's just getting back to the normal protein intake. The uh, if, if anyone's heard of NHANES, it's the National Health and Uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It's a survey that's in across um, uh, America asking about adults and what their habits are for health and nutrition. They found that adults are over-consuming protein, almost upwards of 1.4 to 1.5. That's almost double Mm -hmm. the amount of protein that's recommended. So, you know, when we talk about this low-protein diet, a lot of times it's just a matter of getting back down to the just the recommended amount and then re-evaluating. Yep. And I'll tell you, it seems like everything on the store shelves is bragging about how much protein is in there. And it gives a perception that more protein must be good for us. And for Mm -hmm. us kidney patients, over-proteining, I guess that's the word, um, is not helpful for us. Yeah. That's, that's not something we want to do. Uh, but it is kind of interesting how it's in everything. And I've noticed that even cereal, I I look for fiber. I'm looking for some whole grains. I'm looking for very low sugar. You know, Mm -hmm. there's certain, of course, low sodium, potassium, phosphorus, but everything seems to be bragging about 20 grams of protein, a little tiny bar or something like that. And it's like, whoa, I, I don't think people realize just how much of their daily protein allowance or target that little tiny bar takes up if you eat it yeah yeah it is uh it's something that many people do need more protein and you know that's that's a whole different conversation that we could very much have even (laughs) related to kidney issues but it's this it's this perception that like you said more protein is better Mm -hmm. and you know if we can marketing right food marketing is such a huge deal so if they can throw that out there then they can make more money just because they put on the front of the label how much protein they have. Yep. Now, you mentioned that when we adjust our protein, we also have to adjust our fats and our carbs. Can you you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, are we increasing them? Are we bringing them down? Uh, how, how is that balance, you know, typically yeah. done? So a lot of people think of and they start to kind of get into this concept of the ketogenic diet, which we've talked about before in the very general term of ketogenic diet. I'm not always crazy about it because a ketogenic diet means high fat, Mm -hmm. low carb, moderate protein. Okay. So that's different than a low protein diet. So it is another way of changing the percentages or the ratios of the three macronutrients. Again, Mm -hmm but it's not what we're looking at here. So in this type, in a a low protein diet, one that we're looking at for kidney health, it means that yes, the fat content is going to go up and the carbohydrate content may or may not go up. Um, In a lot of cases, I'm really looking at people just getting the regular recommended amount of carbohydrates, which is Mm -hmm. 45 to 65% of your whole day's worth of calories coming from carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are still great and helpful for our brain health. They have the fiber, all of these good nutrients, the number one source of energy for us. So it's really, really good to have. But because we're cutting down on the on the protein, we're gonna make some modifications on those. So 
most more more often than not, it really comes from increasing the source of fats in our diet. And that's where this, this concept, this term of a kind of a modified keto diet comes into place. Yeah. And it's important also the source of our protein and our fat. There's, there's fats that are better than Mm -hmm. other fats. I've seen a lot of the keto diets, kind of a shortcut diet. You go on YouTube, search up keto diet. You're going to get a ton of videos. And a lot of them are saying, hey, go to Wendy's, get the quadruple cheeseburger, bacon, max, whatever, and quadruple the cheese and stuff. Yeah, (laughs) no bun, no bun, no ketchup. that is going to be the worst part. (laughs) Globs of mayonnaise, tons of the fake cheese. Um, And it's kind of like a, almost like a shortcut to keto, but it's not healthy. That is not a long-term thing. And that's definitely not something kidney patients or people who care about their kidneys no, no, that's a should be doing. A heart attack. Yeah. That's what that is. So we always got to look at the sources. Now, when it comes to plant protein versus animal protein, we've talked before um, that there is a difference. And we may have some people here who have not heard about that in any of our past shows. So could you touch on that real quick? Yeah, of course. So I am a really big proponent of the plant-based diet. If you guys are familiar with my background, my experience, I am a renal dietitian who helps people. I help people uh, individually and in my course with focusing on a plant-forward diet, a plant-based diet. And that includes using plants as their source of protein, which it is so such a myth to think that you cannot get your protein from plants. And especially we're talking about low protein, that's going to be even easier to hit that goal. Like it's hard to do a low protein diet. I'm not even kidding. But Mm -hmm. the plant proteins will give you the protein that your body needs and help to prevent some of the acidity that comes from the animal products. Animal proteins are more acidic. Yes. And your kidneys, when your kidneys are damaged, you're already more prone to be acidic. So eating more animal proteins can tend to push the acidity more that way. That's when the doctors come in with their sodium bicarbonate tabs Mm -hmm. or people think that they need to take baking soda. You know, we can go again down a whole rabbit hole there. But with the plant proteins, they're generally more alkaline, meaning they're going to fight that acidity. And it's going to help preserve that acid base balance for your kidneys. So no matter where you're at as far as your diet, if you want to go entirely plant-based or if you just want to try adding more plant proteins to your diet, it really is all about balance, your preference and your goals, what you really want to do. So I am a huge fan of at least trying to swap out some of your animal proteins for plant proteins. Yep, and I'll tell you, I can tell a difference or I can tell you if I'm going to go get labs tomorrow, I can tell you what my BUN will probably be based on have I eaten animal protein. If I eat mm-hmm. animal protein, my BUN goes up and it can get kind of ugly up there. If, and this is kind of a way of cheating my labs in a way, because my doctors want to make sure I'm eating more animals or less animal protein, more plant-based stuff, eating healthier. If for a week before my labs, I cut all animal protein, oh, my bun comes down nicely. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's amazing how quick you can impact it. But it's what you were saying. A lot of people, we think of, okay, if I go and I eat some red meat, I eat a steak, there's the hyperfiltration that it does. Our kidney's going to kind of work a little harder. It might cause some inflammation. Uh, but we forget about what it's doing to our pH balance. And our BUN is a direct response to that. Mm-hmm. So who should be following a low protein diet because I don't want everyone out there to think, uh oh, I need to go low protein right now. I was just diagnosed stage two, GFR 87. Do I need to go low protein? Right. No, this is not a diet for everybody. And really important too, it's not a diet that you want to take lightly or even. Uh, you know, trying on your own is risky, really, really risky because there's some risks involved. We'll talk more about that, but in general, following a lower protein diet can be really helpful for people in stages four and stage five, not on dialysis. Evidence shows that those later stages of kidney disease can benefit from that lower protein intake. 
Awesome. Let me tell you, we have so many questions popping up. Oh, <laughs> At the end, we're going to come back and I'm just going to try to get through as many of them as possible. A lot of these questions are addressed in the material that's coming up, at least in the outline, the questions I have for Jen. Perfect. Uh, all right. So we've talked about who kind of who should not follow a, a low protein diet. Um, it's, it's good for people who are stage four, stage five, and there's research supporting that. And my doctors, that's what they told me. You need to go plant-based, uh, vegetarian, vegan, find something there that you can do. And I didn't have to do it overnight, but they said, mm -hmm. get there, move that direction. And I, I'm so close, so close. Now I still have some chicken and stuff every so often, but the majority of my meals do not contain um, animal protein or a high amount of, I definitely am eating a reasonable amount of mm -hmm. protein per day. And I was shocked. I was like so many people eating far too much protein. Yeah. All right. Oh, I wanted to add, yep. I wanted to add one more thing too about another group that needs to be careful with the low protein diet. And this is something that I learned literally this morning. I was on a call with the National Kidney Foundation getting updates about some of this information. So this is like hot off the press, very, very new information. Um, but regarding the low protein diet, regardless of your stage, if you have diabetes, type one, type two, if you have blood sugar control issues, it is not strongly recommended that you follow a low protein diet, mm. especially on your own. So remember when we talked in the beginning about the different macronutrients, there, there involves some changes of those macros. With blood sugars, that includes carbohydrates, so there is that factor yep. involved. So you really, really, really wanna be careful with that. 100% find a dietitian. If you can't find a renal dietitian, if you have diabetes, find a, di uh, find a dietitian that's certified in diabetic education, a CDE. They can really help with focusing on your blood sugar control. And once you get that taken care of, that you can advance towards a renal dietitian or you know find better support that way. But for, for someone who has diabetes, across the board, any stage, you want to be really, really, really uh, careful about doing a low protein diet. I would not advise it without a dietitian on board to help you with that blood sugar management. Yeah, and I can see that because you have the three sources of energy, your, your protein, your fats, your carbs, and we're cutting down on protein. And so we're kind of getting maybe a little heavy. And if you're on the carbs, which where sugar could be, and I can see that having, you know, making it more difficult to manage your blood sugar. So it definitely mm -hmm. sounds like great advice. Get your blood sugar under control, then work with a dietitian, either one who specializes in diabetes or a renal dietitian, if you're going to do a low protein diet. So what are some of the benefits if I'm the right person, I'm stage four, and I work with the renal dietitian and I do it right, I'm not just gonna go cut protein myself and kind of hope and pray that it, 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 it works out for me. What are some of the benefits of going low protein if I do it right? Yeah, there's uh, some really great benefits that are coming out in the research, finding that the low protein diet does a lot of things really specifically related to your kidney health. So for one, we're seeing that it really can help keep your kidneys functioning longer and keep you staying off of dialysis. There's tons of research that talk about the low protein diet as a way of preventing dialysis. So that mm -hmm. is huge to keep, the kid keep your kidneys functioning with how much you have, really, really big. The other thing is that they notice less protein leaking in the urine. Mm -hmm. So that is another factor. And, as and they someone had down, asked that question earlier. And I, I want to add a little bit to that. I can't find it. There's so many questions that have popped up, so many comments. <laughs> it's very active today, especially on YouTube. Um, when I, you know, I had severe protein leakage in the beginning and the doctors wanted me to cut back on protein and also on certain foods that, that are known to cause inflammation. And my doctor explained it to me, my kidneys are inflamed and that's mm -hmm. helping me leak more protein. And we wanted to reduce the inflammation and see what impact that had on my protein leakage. Uh, we got it, got it down to where I was leaking very little, which was a fantastic sign. They said, James, you, you, your kidneys, You've got some more room to improve. We're seeing good signs. This is a great first step. 
Um, it, it tells us your kidneys aren't as bad as they may appear. Um, and that's when I then had to figure out why am I still leaking it? Um, it could have just been the damage, but I was, mm-hmm. of course we were looking at everything it could be. And my doctor found something somewhere said, I want you to cut out soy that can cause inflammation. Um, and I cut out soy, boom, no leakage whatsoever. And we did some, some, I don't know if they did blood tests or what, but found out I have a small allergy to soy, which is <laughs> sad because I love edamame and things like that. Mm. I, I still eat yeah, them. Yeah, that's Just, hard. I eat them in, uh, in balance now. I don't sit down with a giant bag of edamame and, <laughs> and eat it while watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah. But that was a great thing. By you know, I went low protein and low in, inflammation, and that helped reduce my protein leakage. And we had a few people asking about that. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that. Good. Yeah, it's a huge thing. And I mean, protein in the urine is a scary thing. It's it's one of the indicators of kidney damage. So if there is this diet that is can be safely done under medical supervision, then that is a really, really great opportunity to help protect your kidneys. And I, I'm just really excited about that for mm-hmm. people. All right. So what are so, some other benefits? I kind of cut you off there. (laughs) That's okay. I mean, of course, you know, James, you and I can talk about this stuff and there's a million tangents. We can go off into each of these little tidbits. Uh, But okay, so we talked about the acid-base balance. So by reducing the proteins, you're reducing your risk of metabolic acidosis. So that's the increase of acid in your blood. There's also the lower oxidative stress that has to do with that inflammation less insulin resistance for people who have some blood sugar imbalances, controlled blood pressure, which Mm -hmm. is another one of the top causes of kidney disease. And again, we talk about focusing on what to do to manage the cause of your kidney issues. If you're going to control your blood pressure, that's really going to help. So you're also going to be seeing less uremic toxins and better control of phosphorus, which is such a challenge for a lot of people. So to have a a lower phosphorus and maybe even less medications for some Mm -hmm. people, I know the ones out there who take phosphorus binders would love to not be on phosphorus binders. That's a huge benefit. I would love, and I I hope that maybe within a year or so I can reduce my blood pressure meds because I feel like, I feel like in the morning I'm eating a small meal, just taking my blood pressure meds. Uh, but my mm-hmm. blood pressure is under control, and that's very, very important. I'm not going to miss any tablets. Um, taking them all as prescribed on time, but I still got to lose some weight, eat a bit healthier, and hopefully I can reduce that. Now I'll, I'll just be happier. You know, if I if I only have to take half the pills in the morning, and that that reduces a lot, so I'd be really, really happy. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that would be. It's always so exciting. It's something that I really take uh, a lot of joy in when my clients can safely come off of their medications. Mm-hmm. It's, it's such a huge win and it's now, so motivating to continue that lifestyle. Yeah. Now, what are some of the risks? So we heard a lot, of, a lot of great benefits for those that are stage mm-hmm. four and five with a low pr- protein diet. What are some of the risk of going with a low protein diet? Cause I'm guessing there are some, otherwise everyone would be on it. That's stage four and right. five. Right. So again, we have to filter out the people that this would really be beneficial for. So we're not looking at the early stages of kidney disease. We're also not looking at people on dialysis who need more protein in their diet. Mm -hmm. But with a lower protein diet, we're talking about a restriction. And what can happen is a risk of malnutrition. Another term for this that you might hear from doctors or even dietitians is a PEW that's protein energy wasting, as in your body is not getting the protein it needs, right? A low protein diet. Yep. And it's basically using your lean body mass, your muscles, the protein that you have in your body to use as energy, which is not the safe and healthy way. So that is really where you can have the unintentional weight loss. You can further damage your kidneys if this isn't yeah. done correctly. So it's really, really important to do this in the in the really correct way because if it's not done correctly, it's just going to lead to more damage, more inflammation, more kidney issues, weight loss. It can make your anemia. A, lo- a lot of people oh. in different stages of kidney disease experience anemia. And when we're talking about low protein, they're cutting out protein sources. It can be, it can increase their risk of further worsening anemia. With anemia comes less oxygen to your organs, including your kidneys, 
which means less kidney function because the kidneys aren't getting the oxygen that it yeah. needs for the cells. So it's really this cascade of concern that comes across doing a diet like this on your own because it, it, it is just you know, a few missteps can lead to some, some pretty bad outcomes. So it's a hundred percent something that you should be having your healthcare team be a part of, have a dietitian that's helping to monitor for those nutritional um, malnutrition signs and make sure your doctor is aware. And for anyone out there who has been lucky enough to not suffer from anemia, of every problem I had, and I had pretty much every symptom. I mean, we're talking all the gross ones, okay? Uh, the not able to sleep, the the metallic taste, everything tastes like a penny, you know, all those awful things. The worst easily was anemia. Just dreading getting up out of a chair just because it took so much effort. And I felt like I was wearing like a hundred pound weighted shirt or something and walking across a room, a small room, mm -hmm. stopping in the middle to catch my breath. It's like, what's wrong? You, you feel the life kind of being sucked out of you. And it's because you know, you're, you're probably low on red blood cells, which then pick up hemoglobins, which you're low on that go to your lungs, grab oxygen and deliver it to all the organs, the brains, everything for them to function. That's how your body breathes. While we think breathing is bringing in air to our lungs, red blood cells got to transport hemoglobin, pick up the oxygen and go deliver it to all the organs throughout our body. And you're suffocating. That's what it is. It's a very mm -hmm. slow suffocation where you're just getting just enough energy, enough oxygen to stay alive. And mm -hmm. oh, you don't want to be there. So knowing that eating a, a low protein and eating plant-based can help reduce the chances of anemia or help you control it. I'll tell you guys, you don't want to have anemia if you can avoid it. And mm -hmm. I was so happy. I, I clearly remember two, two times, two points in my recovery from kidney failure. I remember the day that my kidneys no longer hurt or my back didn't hurt. It really, you know, it, it feels like lower back pain. I remember that day. I clearly remember. As a matter of fact, I was doing a video that day and I commented on the video, you know what? For the first time, my back doesn't hurt. I'm standing up and it doesn't hurt. I remember that. And I remember walking to the mailbox and making it without stopping. And it took me a long time. And I still couldn't make it to the neighbor's driveway, but I went there and I my anemia kept getting better and better and better. You know, I started cooking with cast iron. Um, in the beginning, I used a lot of minimally processed frozen foods and it wasn't cooking for myself and making my own foods, which is what I should have done. Um, but I found ways to get the things that I needed, a little more iron, a little more uh, folic acid, you know, B9, B12, some vitamin C. and exercising or being a little more active and getting rid of anemia, but you guys don't want to be there. So I just wanted yeah. to kind of, to emphasize that. I did not know this could stop that. If I had well, known, I would have been better I mean, at it or, or not stop it. If it could have helped address it in my it, management it's, of it. It's possible, but really what I'm, I want to highlight is that if it's not done right, it can make mm -hmm. anemia worse. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the risk. Yeah. Is if it's, if a low protein diet is not followed, and really, really safe and closely, then it can make the anemia worse because the body senses that really low protein yep. and feels that malnutrition. Okay, very good. Yeah, so don't do not do it wrong. Work with the dietitian. That's the yeah. big takeaway there. All right, so what are some foods? We've had a lot of people ask, uh, ask you know, what can I kind of add to my diet um, if I'm on a low protein diet? Because we got to have that balance between the fats, the carbs, and the lower protein. Right. Well, uh, I don't think this is going to come as a shock to anyone, but fruits, vegetables, even whole grains, healthy fats, these are all good components of a low protein diet. Fruits and vegetables are typically low in protein, at least especially lower compared to animal products. Um, and then some plant products, you know, beans, legumes, those are still higher in proteins. But Again, it always goes back to the plant-based diet. It goes yeah. back to this making sure you're getting enough fruits and vegetables. So 
something to consider with that being said is that many people, especially if we're focusing on stage four or stage five, that potassium could be a concern. So that's going to be something that you want to be mindful of. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to cut out everything high potassium, that you have to eliminate all your favorite foods. It really is just kind of focusing on a couple things, making changes, reviewing, talking with your doctor, talking with your dietitian, continuing to review, check and assess and try again and check and assess and try again. So it's all about this balance, but there's tons of low potassium fruits and vegetables that you can enjoy and, and do really well from. So, um, but really we want to focus on a lot of the healthy fats to include, because when you're cutting out protein, you're cutting out a lot of calories as well. And again, Mm. we've got to put those calories back in. So we want to focus on some of the high calorie foods too. Yeah. And what are some of those fat sources that, um, are good for us to look at adding? So some of my favorites are the plant oils. I am a big fan of olive oil. I used to use olive oil for my cooking. And I've recently in the past, uh, in the last year or so, I've switched more to avocado oil. So avocado oil is my go-to cooking oil. And people think, oh my gosh, it's avocado, it has potassium. No, no, no. It is the oil of the avocado. Not it. It's not a potassium Uh, It's not a high potassium content thing, just like coconut oil isn't high potassium. Coconut oil is very high in saturated fats, which is why I'm not a huge fan of it. But um, avocado oil is a really, really great healthy fat and can tolerate high temperatures for cooking. The other oil I love is sesame oil, which is one that's not for cooking, but more for really a good flavor enhancer and adding to stir fries, adding to Uh salads. It's so good and flavorful. So those are some of my top oil recommendations. I love chia seeds, flax seeds. Just make sure they're ground. You have to have ground flax seeds otherwise uh, because we can't digest the full Mm. flax seed. It'll pass right through us. So ground flax seed or even flax seed oil is an option as well. I've had had clients take flax seed oil, a really great source for omega-3s. Walnuts, pecans, some macadamia nuts. Avocado, of course, but that is higher in potassium. Yep. Um, hemp hearts, and I love olives. So, oh, I love olives. Mm-hmm. I always have. That's my um, my Achilles heel. Whenever I go anywhere and there's some kind of way of adding olives, I add it. Um, at home, I do like adding them myself. I wash them, try to get rid of all the sodium that's at least on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've discovered. I'm not as good as you, Jen, but I've discovered slicing them up. Okay. <laughs> you would laugh. It takes me forever to slice up one olive, one like queen oh. black olive. <laughs> it takes me forever, but I slice it up in really thin slices. That way it kind of spreads because their flavor is kind of strong. So you don't need as many olives. So, uh, so I really like that when it's something that I can just use a little bit of. Um, yeah on my in my in my food and i like that you mentioned the the nuts i love the walnuts i love the pecans uh both those are are ones that have some fiber in them and again i like chopping those up i'll add those to my stir fry i add those mm-hmm. to salads um, i'll even add those if i make some cauliflower rice or something like that i'll chop up walnuts in the in the blender got the gigantic mm-hmm. blender and i put just a little bit of walnuts in there <laughs> Sprinkle yeah. it in there and it gives me a little bit of a crunch here and there. And it's not too bad of a crunch. It's not, a, not, a, not an odd crunch, but it helps mm-hmm. add some flavor and texture to uh, cauliflower rice, which mm-hmm. has become my go-to rice replacement um, when I'm here at home. Yeah. When I go out, I love purple rice. And then I go for some brown rice if purple rice isn't available. I eat oh, a lot interesting. of- Interesting. I love Korean food. I love, I pretty much love <laughs> all the food outside the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so much flavor. Yeah, a lot more flavor. Now, what are some foods that we probably should keep an eye on, possibly even avoid or greatly limit when we're on a low protein diet? So right off the bat, you have to be super, super careful with your animal proteins. This is some of the this is some of the, the components of the diet that are the highest in protein. A little bit goes a long way. So for I'll give you an example. Um, just an egg. One egg is about six to seven grams of protein. When we're talking about a low protein diet, it's generally about 40 grams a day. So six grams from one egg of the 40 grams mm. per day 
a four ounce chicken breast is about 21, no, 28 grams, 30 grams of protein. So having one four ounce chicken breast is basically your protein for the entire day. And you still would have to consider the little bits of protein that you get from the rest of your food. So yeah. and that's not that protein. big of a piece of chicken. That's, no. you know, we got to remember that's, 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's not that yeah. much chicken. It's not, it's not. So really when it comes to a low protein diet, that's one of the first things that likely will be cut out are the animal proteins because it's just, it's, it's so high in protein. You, you can't, follow a true low protein diet and it really include a lot of those things, maybe a little bit, you know, an ounce here, an ounce there, but it, it just adds up so dang fast. And there are some high protein plant-based foods, like I mentioned. So like the soy, you know, tofu, edamame, different beans, uh, seeds and nuts. So those can be high in protein, something to be careful of. Again, um, there is some protein in the diet, so it still is going to be included, but it's really, it comes down to the quantity. So you want to be really, really careful when it comes to the protein and you track all of this is really important. Yep. Now a question that was asked earlier and Allison just reminded me of it when she asked about salmon, when it comes to like animal protein, you know, we, we there's red meat, chicken, um, I guess the white meats, however it's, it's ranked are some better or are some worse than others. And I'm in my mind and I don't know this, I'm thinking red meats at the top of this is the one you should cut out first is red meat. And then maybe, you know, cause so I, I avoid red meat. I'll have chicken. Yeah. I may have some egg. Um, I think it's about it. Actually, I'm, yeah, I, think I'm, I, I think I'm only eating chicken. I'm eating eggs and chicken breast. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I definitely advise red meat is one of the first things to eliminate because of the acid load for one of the mm -hmm. protein. Uh, there's other health concerns related to red meat, even not related to kidney issues. I mean, everybody knows in general, limiting red meat is the, the best recommendation. So when we do start talking about limiting the other proteins, it is it still comes down to the fact that they're high protein and animal proteins are going to just provide a, a bigger protein load in the diet and it's yeah. going to be more to take on. So you can do it step by step if you want to be testing it out to see how it looks, see how the labs look. Again, I, I still 100% am going to say you should work privately with a dietitian, work one-on-one -on -one to get that direct feedback as far as your labs and your diet recall, your food journaling, any, like, anything like that goes, working with a dietitian is going to be really helpful. Yep. And now cheese, does that, that counts as animal protein because it's made from cows, goats, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I mean, just a couple of tablespoons of cheese can, like shredded cheese, can be like six to eight grams of protein. Wow. So. Yeah, it adds up really quick. We just don't realize how much it adds up, how fast and quickly it adds up. So uh, cheese is going to be something that's also considered to be higher in protein, depending on the type of cheese and the quantity, of course. But it is still something that you want to be aware of. Now, someone earlier asked a good alternative to cheese, and I can't remember what it's called. You taught me it. I have a big old bag of it. I put it on salads. Uh, what's it called, Jen? James, come on, you got what it. Is, I, I don't want to go. I want to say some kind of fungus, but I don't. I mean, it is deactivated. It is nutritional. Yeast. Yes. Nutritional <laughs> yeast. There we go. And I was like, I don't want to guess what I think it is because that sounds gross. Yeah, I got a big <laughs> bag. I ordered it on Amazon. Um, read all the reviews and stuff and a little bit goes a long way. I sprinkle it on stuff like a salad or something like that. And it's, it's not as good as like Parmesan cheese or anything like that, but it is an awesome cheese substitute for me. I've never yeah. tried it like on a sandwich or anything like that because I don't eat sandwiches, uh, but it's fantastic for sprinkling on stuff. And I don't know all the benefits of it, but when you mentioned it as an alternative for cheese, I was like, I gotta get this, I gotta try it. And it has a unique taste. It's not bad, it doesn't have an aftertaste. And it mixes great 
with dressings. You know, yeah. I even I might even put some in a dressing, mix it up, kind of like pretending I'm a chef now, and then I'll pour that on my salad or something like that. And oh, it mm-hmm. tastes great. All yeah, right. it's 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 a really good replacement, and it's so easy to mix into to so many recipes to give it that kind of cheesy umami flavor. Yeah. All right. What about supplements? So if we are on a low protein diet, I'm guessing there's going to be some things that we may not be getting enough of. And I want to make sure everyone understands supplements are used because you have a deficiency in something. You just don't take supplements thinking, Ooh, if I take this bottle of X, Y, Z, my kidneys are going to get better. It doesn't work that way. Supplements are when you have a deficiency of something that you're not getting in your diet or naturally from the sun or something like that. And it helps fill that gap so that you you have what your body needs. But are there supplements that someone on a low protein diet may be encouraged by their dietitian to add to their daily pills that they take? Yeah. So there are some supplements, uh, one in particular, when we're talking about the low protein diet or very low protein, which is even a drop below the low protein diet is a supplement category called keto analogs. Now keto analogs are a form of amino acids without the nitrogen compound of the amino acid Mm -hmm. included. So they remove the nitrogen, which is associated with the blood urea nitrogen. So your labs are talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. About the protein, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're cutting down on protein, like we said, your low protein diet, you're at risk for malnutrition because you're not getting adequate protein, uh, keto analogs. And this is now becoming, it, they've been using it in Europe and Asia for a little bit longer. Um, America's a little slow on this stuff, <laughs> unfortunately, but I'm sure nobody here is surprised, but, um, it is something that is, generally supportive for the very low protein diet, sometimes the low protein diet as well to make sure your body's getting enough of those amino acids. So those essential amino acids that your body can't make and that you are not being able to get enough of from the low protein diet. I will be really, really specific here in this concept. It is a medical food. It is a medical supplement. It requires calculations related to the dosing of how much you take. So it is something that a dietitian will help calculate for you as far as your basically prescription of it. So being a medical food, it is a supplement that is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA, FDA does not regulate regular over-the-counter supplements. It is, that is one of the concerns when it comes to supplements is that there's nobody Mm -hmm. overseeing and making sure that they're putting in what they say they put in. Keto analogs are a medical food. They know it's for the situation of low protein diet, making sure that people are taking this for medical conditions. So the FDA does regulate and does review the keto analogs. So that's something just just kind of be aware of related to the difference of the supplements. So I hear, our, I don't know if you guys can hear our, our yeah. garbage man driving. <laughs> yeah. They, they need, they need, they need, earlier. they need a break job. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, so the keto analogs are something that you may need to take, but this will be determined from your doctor, your dietitian. Again, this really comes from that communication with your team and it's different from the amino acid supplements you might come yep. across in your regular supplement store or like the vitamin store or whatever. So those amino acids can, will still have that nitrogen compound to them. So it might be helpful. And I've had some clients take them, uh, but it's really case to case basis. We still track the labs and we still look at the effects of certain supplements. So really, I cannot stress this enough. I do not want you guys to go out and be searching and buying keto analogs and thinking this is going to save everything because it's not. This is not something that will be curing anything. If it did, you guys know we'd be screaming it from the rooftops. So yep, that's exactly. Not so, okay. so, so if I need, so if I'm, I try to figure out how to word this question. Um, I'm assuming that if I need keto analogs, um, my dietitian will work with my doctor and say, Hey, we need to do this blood test or something to determine that. Is there like a test that will say, Hey, mm-hmm. you need this? Well, it's not, I mean, there are, there are ways that we can assess your, 
protein status, we, we do check your weight. So that's something that dietitians will be monitoring is for that unintentional weight loss. The one we'll thing that makes my your... blood pressure always go up, that scale. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about unintentional, as in you weren't trying to lose weight and then you lost weight because your body is ah. basically eating away your lean body oh, mass. Yeah, 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 Not yeah. yeah. Good got kind that, of got that. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be assessing for other factors there, but it really comes down to the diet. It comes down to assessing how much protein you're already eating because we don't want to add. It's still a protein supplement. So mm -hmm. if you take too much of it, it's going to go back to that thought of a high protein diet, which is not good for the kidneys. Yep. So taking extra amino acids or, or I'm sorry, taking extra like keto analogs or something. It's not like a more is better concept. It's we just want to get it to the right amount to where your body is covered and safe and taken care of. Yeah, and those and the the amino acids like like Bragg's, I, I see that a lot. A number of people have mentioned it. Uh, those those still have the the nitrogen on them, and and it's it's a different thing. And should kidney patients be avoiding Bragg amino acids? I I haven't tried yeah. it, and I'm thinking it's high in sodium. Oh yeah, it's so high in sodium. I think it's yeah. higher in sodium than just regular soy sauce, which we know is high in sodium. Yeah. So. It, it is it is not something that I'm a huge fan of because of the sodium content, and it's not the same thing when we're talking about keto analogs or um, keto analogs are a fraction. They are just a piece of the amino acids, the component that your body needs without the component that's going to make it harder for your body. The Bragg's, I'm... I'm kind of over with, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, if you're looking for a replacement, I'm a hundred percent behind the coconut aminos, which is mm. from the sap of coconut tree. And it is a great low sodium replacement. And I want to, I, I, I think you said that before that kind of rings a bell. I think you might've recommended that before. Yeah. So, I, I added it to my, uh, I added it to my Amazon shop because people have been asking me for more specific recommendations for, yep. for food and things like that. So I did, um, I did put that up there. If anyone wants to check out some of my recommendations, you can go to jenhernandezrd.com uh, forward slash shop. And that is a listing of a lot of different things that I recommend based off of what I do and my cooking demos and all that. Yep. Awesome. So let's say, and, and I just want to kind of, I'm going to, I want to touch base on a few of the points we already said, because a few people joined us late. Um, a low protein diet isn't for everyone. Um, it's most often used for patients that are stage four and five, not on dialysis, because you probably mm -hmm. need more protein when you're on dialysis. It's not something you should be doing yourself. You need to work with a renal dietitian, or if you're diabetic, work with a dietitian who's familiar with um, diabetes and can help you, because there, there could be some issues with managing your blood sugar if you go on a low protein diet. Um, Darn it, there were a few other points I wanted to put in here because a few people have come in late. And they've asked some questions that I know we covered. Like, oh, let me try to get them all real quick. Um, what were some of the other I high a, points? I have one that I can add here. Somebody, um, Mary Ellen, <laughs> asked in our Facebook watch party yep. if unintentional weight loss is a sign of the need for keto analogs. Ooh. And no, that is um, – you're kind of jumping a couple steps there because – Weight loss, especially, you know, the unintentional weight loss, there's a lot behind that. We don't know automatically that's what's causing it and that's the solution. So it needs to be, uh, it needs to be determined by your healthcare team what is going on there and, and what's being caused by that. So it, that's not like the direct go-to. That's not the, I lost weight. I need keto, keto analogs. I mean, for the record, keto analogs are expensive. They are a pricey. Um, they're, I want to say like a hundred, couple hundred dollars. And it's not like a do it for a little while and you're done. It's a ongoing investment. Mm. So it, it's something that you that you definitely need to, um, you don't just want to tread lightly into it. You need to really be aware that you know what you're doing and that the, the doctor and dietitian are also aware, really important that they're aware of what's going on there too. Yeah, very good. So could you walk us through, let's say I'm stage four, which I'm not everybody, mm -hmm. but let's say I'm stage four and I'm, I'm working with a renal dietitian and I'm doing a low prote protein diet. Can you walk me through an example of kind of what does my meals and snacks for maybe a, a, this, a day, what's an mm -hmm. example of a low protein day? Uh, Cause I know 
whenever we hear diet, low protein diet, the word diet is so scary. And we often think of diet meaning without, to take away, when I like to really think of diet as portion control. It's make this choice. Right. It's kind of push you which direction to make the choices so that you're getting the better thing for your body based on where you are right now. So can you walk through like what would a just a day mm-hmm. on a low car, a low not low carb, a low protein diet look like? So let's say for breakfast, it, you could do something like a great hearty bowl of cream of wheat, which is lower in protein than oatmeal. And you can add berries to that. You can even add some ground flax seeds for those heart healthy omega threes. If you oh. want to add some chia seeds for the omega three and the fiber, that's great. They do have some protein, but again, we're talking about low protein, not no protein. Mm-hmm add some of those, like I said, the berries, and then of course your maple syrup, your sweetener. So you have a great comforting breakfast bowl right there with a ton of fiber and nutrients for you. That'll definitely fill you up for breakfast and keep you full for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But let's say you get hungry in a few hours, which a lot of Mm -hmm. us do as we're going through our day. So you could have a piece of fruit, like an apple. And I think instead of something like nuts or seeds, which would be higher in protein, you could do popcorn, which is still a whole grain, but, and has fiber in it, which is really, really great. Mm -hmm. Then for lunch, usually I want to say, I mean, at least right now, like it's still so hot here. I can't think of a warm meal. But I will say for a cold lunch, a nice refreshing lunch, doing a really robust wrap with a lot of vegetables in there, really loading it up with your lettuce, your onions, even some tomato, cucumber, carrots. You can do a little bit of hummus, which again Mm -hmm. has a little bit of protein there for you, also has a lot of fiber. And then avocado too. So you want to be careful again about your potassium, what you can and can't have. Focus on the foods that you can have if it needs to be lower potassium and then just kind of add more of that to it. And then if you can have a side of maybe some chips and salsa for a little extra crunch and that uh, satisfying side. Then let's say in the afternoon you get hungry again and you're looking for another snack. How about you just whip up a nice, again, cool and refreshing fruit and veggie smoothie. So I always am a fan of adding vegetables into smoothies and not just letting it be fruits because Mm -hmm. we all could use more vegetables. So throwing in a handful of spinach, again, with some berries, whatever kind of milk you like. Rice milk is a low, low protein milk. Awesome. We had people just asking about milk alternatives. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure it's unenriched because the enriched type of milk will generally have higher added phosphorus, Mm -hmm. and sometimes potassium. So the unenriched milk is going to be good. And in the smoothie like that, you still want it to be really filling and satisfying. So that would be another great opportunity for you to add some ground flax seeds or some chia seeds so that you could give yourself some more fiber and those omega-3s, those healthy fats. And then for dinner, I love, love mushrooms. I don't know about you guys, but it's just like, that is my jam. I mushrooms are my theme. I haven't made it there yet. Uh, people say that the big portobello yes. mushroom is a great alternative for like meat eaters. Uh, I haven't tried it yet. I may love oh my it. Gosh. I may find out I yeah. love it. I tell you what, uh, one of my clients, when we first started working together, she's like, okay, I've got, you know, a couple food rules. One of them is I don't do mushrooms. She's like, they come from the <laughs> ground, they look me. gross. Yeah. She was all about the no mushroom train. But we had a session, um, we, well, we've been working together for a little while now. So I want to say a couple sessions ago, she said, Jen, I had a mushroom from dinner for dinner. And oh my gosh, what have I been missing out on? Oh. And now... Her family is so excited because they're having mushrooms for their meals. And her just like this whole door, this whole world opened up for her of all these different possibilities of using mushrooms in her meals. So I think a grilled, a really big, juicy grilled portobello mushroom. And then you can serve it with some rice and a side salad. Add some of the heart healthy olive oil to that dressing for the salad. It doesn't even need to be like a mixed up dressing. Just drizzle on some olive oil, drizzle on some balsamic vinegar, mm-hmm. you're done. It's good, easy, perfect. And then I always like to add to to finish up my evening with something refreshing and somewhat sweet. And I think frozen grapes will do the trick with that. 
Awesome. So that, that actually sounded like a great day. It didn't sound like, and it sounds like play more than I eat now. Um, I, I skip bre- or I, I don't skip breakfast, breakfast. I have breakfast and dinner. That's pretty much my meals. Um, but, oh, starting the day off with a nice bowl of something filling, high fiber. Mm-hmm. Love that. I love, I can't believe I never did it growing up, adding fruit, uh, you know, things like that to my my bowl of whatever. Um, oh, that sounds great. And I like the snacks that you worked in there. That's very good. And I do popcorn. I make it myself. I bought a thing off of Amazon, this little silicone thing that folds flat. You pop it up. Buy the bulk popcorn seeds, put a little mm-hmm. bit in there. A little lid sits on it and rises as it pops. Put it in the microwave, hit the auto, boom. Make popcorn. Yeah, and then I can put whatever seasoning I want. And I, I think I've mentioned this a few times. I've gone or I've, I've grown to where I now like like some cayenne pepper or something like that. Some, something kind of spicy or some lime. So I'll take uh, the dehydrated limes, the, the powdery ones, and I'll spray sprinkle that on loosely and shake it all up. Just gets it a hint of lime on there and I am happy. Before, I would have never tried that. I was the guy who went to the movie theater and I was at one that was holding up the line at the fake butter thing, just doing this. (laughs) Filling that big old tub with butter. (laughs) So my popcorn would float up. (laughs) Oh, that was so unhealthy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can't say I would be a fan of that. <laughs> oh, you won't believe how many times people be like, come on, you got enough. I'm not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the next thing I want to ask, and this is something I think we all have some challenges with and getting tips here really can go a long way to helping make things easy for us. Um, for all of us, whenever we're told, here's a new diet or a new way to eat, a new lifestyle change. It can be difficult to suddenly make those changes. When I was in the, you know, in the hospital and the doctors told me you got to change your diet. uh, My first thing was, okay, it's going to be a struggle, but I can give up soda, I think. And I gave up soda, have not had a sip of any soda, not even the safer sodas. Um, I've had none. I just drink water. I've had a little bit of coffee, a little bit of tea every so often on, you know, driving long distance or something. I'll have something like that, but tips to help us transition from a traditional high protein, probably high meat diet to a more low protein plant-based diet. Cause those tips, and I, I, I remember one of the ones I shared early that really helped me is I had that craving for McDonald's. I just, mm-hmm. I don't know, I was in love with the McDonald's drive through um, It and me, we were in heaven. Whatever came through that window, I was like, okay, I'll get $10 worth of food. And I, I felt I was eating healthy because I only ate $10 worth. Ooh, boy, too bad, it was kind of bad when the Big Macs were two for four bucks and I'd get four of them. <laughs> <laughs> and a big old giant sweet tea. Oh my goodness, all that sugar in there. But um, oh, that is a sweet tea. It was, you know, it, what made it easy for me to get rid of McDonald's and fast food was I came up with a homemade version of a McChicken and it satisfied me for that mm-hmm. fast food craving. And it was a great step towards being more plant based and healthier. What are some tips for going uh, low protein and more plant based? So I think it's really great to kind of start to build up your arsenal, so to say, of some easy swaps. So for one of my favorite examples is using jackfruit instead of pulled pork or pulled chicken. And if you guys are in my Facebook group, you've probably seen that video from before. And all of my videos, all my cooking demos are in the Facebook group that you can go back and watch and rewatch. And I've done- Plant-powered kidneys. Yes, I, yes, I don't have, a, I got to make an on-screen thing. I don't have an on-screen thing here for it. I need to make that. <laughs> Wait, I might have one well, in here. Let me see. Oh, no, I don't. Go. Darn it. Oh. <laughs> I got to make one. Um, yeah, but it's, you can go to Facebook and just search plant-powered kidneys and the group I'm sure will pop up. Mm-hmm. And it is uh, where I do my cooking demos. I talk a lot about, you know, a lot of these topics related to kidney nutrition. Um, but I did do a cooking demo a while back about pulled, pr- pulled 
pork jackfruit. Mm -hmm. And I have some cans of jackfruit in my pantry. So I'm definitely due for another one of those cooking demos soon. But, um, so that one's a great replacement for the pulled meats that you have. You and I'll tell you, it looked it. incredible. I never made it. Oh, yeah. I haven't made it yet. I downloaded the video because I have a little app that lets me, or a plug it lets me download oh, cool. them. I have that one. I did make the yogurt brittle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did. It was so easy to let the kids make it. They had a, a, a hoop oh. making it. The only thing was they fought over breaking it up. <laughs> Oh, of course, that's the best and part. <laughs> the first one held the pan and we just kind of dropped it onto the countertop and it shattered. And it's like, oh, we're done. We're going to let them take turns, okay. but it was over. Yeah. <laughs> but great yeah, recipes so on the Facebook group. I encourage everyone to follow it. Good, good. But that one looked, um, and it looked, if, if, if you would have served that to me, I would not know that that wasn't pulled pork. It looked mm -hmm. like pulled pork. Throw it on a it's sandwich. So Boom, I would yeah. have probably just loved it. Yep, I think it's really, really great. Uh, another one that I love is instead of ground beef, again, we talked about cutting out that red meat. That's one of the first things I would recommend switching out. And instead of do that, doing some lentils. And lentils can provide a very similar uh, type of consistency and depending on how you cook them, how long you cook them for, what kind of spices you add to them, the flavors, that's the most important part of all of this, right? So making sure that your lentils are having the right kind of flavors and spices to them. You could also, we talked about doing the portobello mushroom and swapping that for like a steak or a grilled piece of meat, anything like that. Or um, chickpeas, I think chickpeas make for a great substitution for like tuna salad or chicken salad where you kind of mash them up. You mix in all those other flavors that are very uh, familiar with our salad recipes, our chicken salad, American salad, right? Cause it's mayonnaise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, but chickpeas make a great alternative. They still do have some protein in them, but it's lower in protein when it comes to comparing them to the chicken, for example. And you can further take care of the protein by adding more of the celery and onion and other flavors and other ingredients in a recipe like that. Yep. And then we had a question here. I definitely want to make sure and hit it because this is a great one. Any condiments that we should avoid that have, you know, maybe protein hiding in it? <sighs> I can't think of any, but I'll tell you guys, I have gone to where I just love super spicy. So here's what I've I've gone to love, why you think. I love spicy stuff because I have to eat it slow. And that was a huge change for me to eat and taste food, not to inhale it. Um, and I like uh, as close to like unprocessed, minimally processed. Um, as a matter of fact, we just saw Pasta Grammar mentioned eggplant meatballs. That sounds delicious. Um, I've never tried that. I wonder if they have a video of it. I'll have to look and see. If not, you guys make a video of it and I'll watch it. <laughs> but any any condiments you can think of that we should avoid? I mean, <gasps> I mean, oh. if a calm condiment, I don't, I don't know if it would really be a condiment per se, but um, peanut butter, you yeah. know, that can be really high in protein. So that adds up really fast. So that would probably be the one that sticks out the top of my head. If you're thinking about um, yogurt or uh, sour cream as a condiment, Ooh, that yeah. would be something to just be aware of. Again, with your with your protein in your diet, everybody has different needs. So you want to just be aware of where you're getting your protein in your diet. And that would be something to be considerate of. Yeah. <laughs> we had an autocorrect incident in the uh, comments. It was a little funny. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. Here. <laughs> he, he meant to put nut butters and it came up oh. earlier as, as, as butt butters. Then he corrected himself <laughs> and reminded everyone it was autocorrect. Um, but yeah, those, those nut butters, actually regular butter. I didn't think of yogurt and sour cream. Those are pack of protein. Um, and mm -hmm. you might consider that to be a condiment. Um, and sour cream is one of those things that I, completely avoided all my life until one day it was accidentally in a taco before I had my kidney problems. And then I'm like, holy cow, I'm putting this stuff on so many things now. It was delicious. So my takeaway is don't be afraid to try things. I will try a mushroom before the end of the calendar year. <laughs> I can't promise too soon. I got to find some place that I, that people can say, Hey, they make, they can cook the mushroom, right? I'm not going to try to cook it because I may hate it. And it may all just be how I cooked it, that I didn't do a good job at it. 
<laughs> yeah, it really, so a mushroom is like a sponge, kind of like tofu. Mm-hmm. It's going to soak up whatever flavor you put on it. So just make sure you marinate it in, in, in whatever kind of flavors that are your good go-to marinade flavors. Yep. All right. So let me see. We are, we're at the top of the hour. We're a little bit over. Any last things you want to add while I look through and see if there's any questions that we haven't, that, you know, maybe we might be able to quickly get answers to. Yeah. Um, well, while you go through that, I will say one of the most important things when it comes to following the low protein or very low protein diet, you know, I've already hopefully emphasized enough to make sure you get help, make sure you have professional help and support with that. The other thing that's going to be really helpful for you is to make sure that you're tracking your protein. And we've talked about good trackers before on here. So I really love chronometer, especially mm-hmm. their, their gold subscription, which is really affordable. Yes. I think it's like dollars a year for the whole year, 40 bucks. And it gives you so much information. And like James had mentioned, when you set up your subscription, you can work with your healthcare team to set goals for your different parameters, which yes. could include protein. So doing something like that would be really, really, really helpful, a great first step because you really want to know what you're putting into your body. And just by logging your food and something like that is very eye-opening and can show you where your protein's coming from. So tracking your protein, knowing where it's coming from, and this has to go with every component of your diet. So your protein, your phosphorus, your sodium, your potassium, all of this stuff can be tracked and more, especially with the uh, chronometer gold. I'm a huge fan of it. And it's something that you can share with your dietitian, Mm -hmm. which I have clients that share their chronometer record with me. And we go through and pinpoint the, uh, the different areas of their diet that they should be focusing on in tandem or in relation to their lab results. Yeah, and I absolutely, so it has a free version, which does all the basic mm-hmm. tracking. I, of course, I, I went with the, the full version. I like that I can set my limits so I, and I can see how close am I. And then if I add a food, boom, I go over. I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna eat that, delete it. I wanna make a different choice. It helps me make those choices. Yep. But the graphs and the charts it can do, all web-based are absolutely amazing. My doctor, My primary care physician, the one who's the leader of my team for helping me get healthier, has the login. He can log Mm -hmm. in and see exactly where I've eaten. So if he gets labs and he's looking at him, he's like, B-U-N, why the heck is it way up? He could go in, log in and go like, well, James had that ribeye he's always been talking about, which everybody have not had yet. I've kind of gotten over it. (laughs) I was craving that like three weeks ago. And never got it past it. But he can look at it and see, oh, he ate that. He shouldn't be eating that. Or or my sodium's too low. And he can look and go like, yeah, yeah, you're not getting your minimum. Because I have a minimum that they want me to hit for a lot of things, especially mm-hmm. potassium and sodium, because I tend to run low on those. And then a maximum not to exceed. But I love with chronometer that he can log in and see all that stuff instead of me sitting there in the office during my appointment, that valuable limited time scrolling through and telling him he can be prepared. And I know not all healthcare professionals do the, the, the prep work, but it's nice when you find those that do, and it's just another tool to help them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's a really great resource as a dietitian. I have my clients do food logging and tracking in, uh, as part of some of the meal planning and things that we do there. So it's really, really helpful to see where you're hitting those goals and parameters. Yep. And I am scrolling through here to see what else. A lot of people mentioned James, um, the true lemon people make that, that is the people who I get my dehydrated lime, lemon, raspberry, strawberry, and cherry flavoring from there's no extra sugar. They dehydrate Mm -hmm. them put them in little tiny packets. Uh, you, I can only buy them 10 packets at a time in a box. I feel so wasteful because I'll go to Walmart and I'll just grab all of them on the shelf and push them in my cart. And I've got all these boxes and I just empty them into a big, um, like a Tupperware container and I put the lid on and click it closed. I have all these boxes. I wish I could buy it in bulk. Um, that, that's what's in. I just finished my cup in here, but that's what's always I never drink just plain water. I always have some kind of flavoring based on dehydrated fruit 
in there just give me a little bit of flavor but it's also great on a salad it's great on sprinkling on popcorn um, you're not adding adding a whole bunch of calories or any sugar or anything like that it's just dehydrated raspberries or whatever the raspberry one isn't good on popcorn i tried it mm. uh, my daughter mm -hmm. does like strawberry i love lemon i love lime those are my favorite ones and in drinking my favorite is the raspberry but a lot of people are asking about hey you know the true lemon do you still use it yes i use it i love that stuff um i wish i could buy it in bulk i i, I did buy a bulk of the lemon well, it wasn't the same lemon. It was little tiny packets for sprinkling on a salad or some chicken or something when you're cooking. It's like, ah, mm -hmm. now I got to open all these tiny little packets. And I bought like a thousand of them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, and they're so tiny. They're like those yeah. little, little salt packets you used to get the little yeah. white ones you rip open. It's like that small. <laughs> and I have a thousand well, of them. Is that, that sounds like a, that sounds like a sous chef assignment. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Let's see what else is in here. Boy, there are, we have had so many comments. It's fantastic. I think we've touched on most of them. Um, let's see. I'm trying to look and see if there's any other ones that might stand out. Hey, we got someone from the Philippines. Hello, Victoria. I don't I don't recognize that name. I, I usually can recognize a lot of our regulars on here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and let's just wrap it up for the evening. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Please share the video. This is great, helpful information for those that are battling with kidney disease. Kidney disease doesn't have to be all negative. And oh, wait, here's a question. This one I remember seeing earlier. Do you have any thoughts? Albutrix. I remember seeing that question pop up earlier. Um, I really don't have any thoughts on it. Um, the only thing I could say from a personal slash professional standpoint, um, they, they do provide keto analogs. Um, it's one of the companies there, that company and keto arena is another company that provides keto analogs. Albutrix, the last I had heard, a client of mine was trying to get them and they were way behind, like months behind mm. on on getting the, the order filled, which in that case was a lot of time wasted, honestly, for my client. Um, but I, I um, it's one of the options out there. I mean, I again, I don't, I've not connected with them. I haven't done any work with them. I really, I'm a little more, more of a fan of the Keto Arena website. I like their website because they have a lot of great information and resources for physicians, for dietitians, and for CKD patients. So I, I like their website in the fact that they are really good at putting all this information on their site. Mm -hmm. Albutrix website for me was you just go and you buy it. And, um, and, and that's it. And it, they didn't provide too much resources from my perspective. I really, I usually refer clients to Keto Arena's website to learn more about them when we talk about keto analogs and the purpose. So, um, yeah, that's basically what I would say in, in regards to that. Very good. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Oh, yeah. Dad Vice TV broke 7 million video views yesterday. Woo! Wow. 7 million people That's have insane. listened to my voice <laughs> talking about <laughs> kidneys. And our next goal is hitting 100,000 subscribers, about uh, probably about 11,000 away from that. Really looking forward to that. Zen YouTube will send me a little plaque with a little silver play button. I think that'd be awesome to put up on the wall back there. All right, thank you everyone. And Jen and I will see you next week. And we also have Dr. Butt next week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. So we got two live shows next week. Everybody have a great rest of your week and we'll see you in the next video. Bye everyone.